Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer. Welcome back to the channel and your first steps into contact sampling. So we've already taken a look at the introduction, a little bit about contact sampling and planned our first instrument. Now that the planning is out of the way and done, we can move on to developing our instrument. So today we're taking a look at how to record acoustic audio samples. So sampling can be a really fun adventure creating something entirely new, or it could be a careful process of recreating something with absolute precision. It's entirely up to you on what you want to capture. Many people have created beautiful sample libraries that you can play and buy that have recreated a particular instrument or a particular section or group of instruments perfectly or as, as near perfect as humanly possible. The aim of these libraries is often to create a performance tool that could replace a real player or at least mock up what a real player will eventually sound like. They're also great if you don't have the budget to pay a performer or the ability to get that type of instrument and performer in a room to record them. However, many libraries also take the opportunity to create something entirely new. They develop different sounds and different textures, different ways of manipulating stuff in order to create something that has never been heard before. I was about to say seen before, but I mean sort of heard really, rather than seen. Now today we're gonna to take a look at recording an acoustic audio source. Now that could be an instrument. If you have a guitar or a piano or a simple wind instrument or hand percussion or kind of anything that you wanna record, you can definitely record that instrument. However, if you don't have all of that around, you can also make use of just random household objects and found sounds. Delia Derbyshire, a fantastic, pioneer in both sampling and electronic music, has often said that the basis of a lot of her sounds were from simple wine bottles or wine glasses. Things like a wine bottle could easily be filled up and then blown over the top of. You could take a simple wine glass and you can obviously strike it and get a particular pitch. You could also run a wet finger around the rim and it can sing out. So there's a lot of different textures that you can get from just very simple random household objects that you probably already have and you don't need to go and buy anything. This salad bowl, for example, is gonna make a wonderful sound right now. It's the largest salad bowl I have. I wish I had something that was a bit larger and a bit kind of deeper in sound, but we can actually tune these a little bit. If I fill this up with water, it will lower the pitch. I went around tapping everything on the, on the kitchen bench, probably annoying my wife in the process, but there you go. Now, when it comes time to recording your audio source, you want to consider what it is you're actually trying to record. Are you trying to record simple, pure notes? Are they going to be short? Are they going to be long? Are they going to be loud? Are they going to be soft? Or are they going to be a combination of all of these things? You want to be able to consider that beforehand. You may have done some of this groundwork, obviously, in your planning stage, but the plan might need to change as you find different things. For example, I found that I couldn't do everything I wanted just by tuning one object. I've had to use a random collection of different glasses and jars in order to make this process work. They also didn't tune perfectly to the uh, C's and G's, or the octaves and fifths that I was hoping for. Uh, so I've had to go with whatever I could get my hands on basically. So it's gonna be a little bit of a different sort of sound than maybe I was hoping for. But as we always say, sampling is an experimentation. Let's dive in and start recording some stuff. So once you've considered everything, then you start recording something. This is where you'll need your audio interface and your microphone and connect it all up and, and get it close to the source. You don't want to be too close that you get anything damaged or, or wet, in this case, particularly when I'm using liquid to be able to tune my bowls. But I don't want to be too far away that I capture so much of the room noise. The closer we are to a signal, the more clear it's going to be. I recommend recording all the samples together just in one bit what we call a monolith file, a simple recording of the whole lot because then that way you've just got one file which you can later divvy up into the different samples. You can also noise treat this a little bit later on as one single file rather than lots of different individual files. So you can get one file, noise treat it, then divide up into samples. Now you want to be able to record at a good level. You don't want to record so low or so quietly that you're too close to the room noise because then obviously as you bring up that sound, you're going to bring up all that room noise along with it. You want to be able to record loud enough that it doesn't clip or peak but that it's above that sort of basic background noise. Depending on your environment at home or the studio that you're working in, 
you'll have different sort of noise volumes. At home, you'll have things like fridges or air conditioners or computer fan noises or traffic passing outside. But in a studio, you might not. You might have a little bit more of a quiet environment to work with, which means that you can have a little bit more of a sensitive microphone. Also keep your wireless devices away, keep your mobile phones away from this recording area, wireless connecting tablets and computers, that sort of stuff away from it. If you need a list of directions, I just recommend printing it out rather than having it up on your phone or something like that, because you don't want any of those devices near your microphone. Your microphone may pick up that radio interference and put it into your samples, which is not exactly what you want. Now the sample rate you record, it's entirely up to you. Obviously the standard for CDs is 44.1 and a lot of audio recordings are still done in 44.1. For film and television, it's 48. And now more music is being recorded in 48. More sample libraries are being recorded in 48 because it makes it a standard that musicians can use in film and television or downsample into the 44.1 for CD later on. So it makes it more flexible. Should you record higher than that, say 96? Well, it could be beneficial. I'm actually gonna record in 96 because I know that I'm gonna to have to stretch and compress these audio files from these bowls a lot further than I may have initially intended. That means if I record at a higher sample rate, I will have more detail and that makes the stretching and compressing of that sound a higher quality with less artifacts. So if you are planning on recording fewer samples and making them stretch a longer way, maybe 96 is the way to go. The benefit of recording high is you can always downsample later on. So if you want your sampler to go from 96 to 48, then you can do that later. That's the great thing about recording a higher level. You can just downsample later. Now this is all studio based, but of course you can hit the field. You can take a Zoom recorder or a mobile phone with maybe a detachable microphone or something like that out into the field and record sounds. Gone are the days where you need heavy, expensive, specialized equipment. You can definitely take a Zoom recorder, which is a handheld device, or even a phone microphone these days are getting pretty good. And you can just record samples that are out in the wild, found sounds. In these cases though, I always recommend wearing a set of headphones and having that connected to the microphone to hear what you're recording. You don't want to record a whole bunch of stuff and go, this is great, and then take it home and find that you've got a huge amount of wind noise or a lot of background noise, or the sound that you're recording in the restaurant is overpowered by the people speaking next to you at the other table. So wear some headphones, check it out as you go, and you should all be all good. Okay, so I spoke about earlier how to record. Now we're actually gonna take a look at how to edit these recordings once we've recorded them. We wanna get them down into individual samples and I've already gone ahead and I've recorded the sounds. You saw me earlier kind of hitting the bowls and recording and miking them up. Now we wanna be able to get them down into individual samples that we can put into a sampler. There's a couple of steps involved. Firstly, it's a great idea with any kind of samples that you're working with to do noise reduction. What I mean by noise reduction is remove the room noise that we spoke about earlier. If you're recording at home particularly, there's often background noises from fridges and air cons and that sort of thing. These can get in the way. That fridge noise, for example, could be in the background of one of those notes. But if you play 10 notes across the keyboard once it's in the sampler, that's 10 times the amount of sound in your instrument because it's gonna be playing back that noise 10 times just like it's playing back the notes. So if we remove the noise, then we get more of just the pure note and that leads to a better sound overall. Now it really does depend on what you've got available to you on how you're going to go about this. I use Isotopes RX, it's a fantastic piece of software. It's a great tool that lets me denoise really, really quickly and it actually works with my door of choice Logic. So I can easily open files from Logic into RX and then save them and have them sync straight back to Logic, which is fantastic. In my Logic session, you can see the monolith recording file there. So you can see there's a couple of hits there. I move on to the next bowl, the next one, and the next one. I think these last two were glasses. And this whole file, of course, was recorded at home, and I'm sure there's some noise in here. Now, the great thing in Logic is that I can jump into Edit, and I can go down to Open in Isotope RX9. I have linked Isotope RX9 to Logic as its external audio editor. So if I open a file here, it opens it up in RX automatically, which is a fantastic feature within Logic. So if I do that now, it'll open up this audio file into RX. There it is. And we can see the individual hits. Now I've already done some noise treatment here. That's why you can't really see anything between these hits. Of course, there, there's me shuffling around here, here, and here as I swap over the different bowls, but you can't actually see any room noise in the gaps where I wasn't moving wasn't doing anything. And that's because at the beginning here, I recorded a bunch of noise, just perfectly still, nothing. And I highlighted it, came over to spectral denoise and learnt what the noise was and adjusted the reduction. 
Once I'd done that, I highlighted everything and I rendered that noise reduction across the file clip. What this has done is it's then gone across the whole clip and just removed all the noise wherever it can find, all those frequencies that make up that room noise. And it's provided a really clear, detailed sample library without any of that noise in the background. As I said, it does depend on the equipment that you've got. There are some free noise reduction plugins. There are ones that come in Logic, for example. Some of them aren't great. Honestly, like you get what you pay for a little bit. I mean, the algorithm that's developed with Isotope, that's doing a really good job and it's a really good quality program. If you use a free one, it might not be able to know what sound and what's the noise that you're trying to remove. It may remove too much and therefore in stripping out the noise strips out part of the detail of the instrument. You have to be careful of that. But if you do have this option available to you or you've got something that you could potentially try, this will make your instrument sound better when you start playing lots of notes together. All right, so normally I would then save that, close Isotope, and it rescans. And there's the file in there, all done. Now what you want to do is you want to divide this monolith recording into individual samples. Now in Logic, there's a really nice feature. If you click on the region, jump up into functions, and then jump to remove silence from audio region. What this does is it tries to pick out where noise is happening and remove the silence. Now you can adjust these thresholds, which is great. So if I bring this down a little bit, we can see that it starts to let in more and more until eventually you know, the whole thing is there because a, there was a certain level of noise here. I can also define what the minimum length of time should be. Like if I want slightly longer samples, I might go, okay, that might be better for me. I can set pre-attack times, post-release times. I quite like this one. This is at a six millisecond pre-attack. That could come in handy later when I start adding on fades. Once I've done that and I've got all my items selected, um, I'll click okay. Now I know that this particular sample here, this is nothing. This is just me rustling about, I'm pretty sure. Just me tapping the drumstick or something like that at the end, I'm not too sure what's going on there. So we can just get rid of that. And then I had a couple of, you know, bung hits that I redid. And I, I remember wanting to redo those. If I zoom in here, let's take a look. I think I've got a few more hits that I need to remove. I'm not sure what this one is. Oh, look at that, it's just me moving a chair. We can get rid of that. All right, and that leaves me with two, 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 and two. So we've got our soft and loud hits of all kinds. So I'm just going to move these up a little bit just so we can deal with them a little bit closer together. It doesn't really matter if they lock to the grid or anything. Ultimately, we just want the sample itself. Now what we want to do is look at fades. Fades are going to be important because you don't want the sound to feel like it's cutting in. There's such a thing as zero point cutover. Basically, audio files move up and down above a center line and below a center line, basically positive and negative. That's what creates our pulses that end up creating the audio that we hear. If I zoom in, you can actually see this happening. So you can see a positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on, dancing around this middle line. If I was to put my cursor here and cut the audio file here, it means that the audio would be starting not from zero, but a positive value. Or if I cut it in at, down at the bottom here, it would be cutting in from a negative value. In both of those cases, as soon as the sound starts to play, it's going to go from zero instantly to whatever value it is, and that's going to cause a clip or a pop or something that we're going to hear, an artifact that we don't want. Ideally, we want to cut at a zero point, the point where it passes zero and it's neither positive nor negative. This is quite hard to achieve. So there is a workaround by using fades. If I zoom out of here a little bit, and I jump into my fade tool, I want to basically put a little bit of a fade there so that as it plays the note, there's no click or pop. Now, again, a nice little feature of Logic, if I just select all these clips, I can put fades on all of them. So if I select my bells here, I can jump into this section under region, under the more category, and I can apply fade ins and fade outs right from here. Very easy to do. This is where remembering the uh, six milliseconds from earlier is quite useful because I can just pop in six here. And that's going to put a six millisecond fade in everywhere. And I might do a fade out of about 500 milliseconds or half a second there. That's just going to tail out anything that might still be ringing out. All right, so we have the files cut up. We have them fading in and out. We're all good to go. There is one final consideration, which is pitch. Sometimes what we record in an acoustic world isn't quite on pitch. Now we can use the sampler to change that later, but that means that we need to go through the individual notes at a later date and, and tune them, and the original files will always be out of tune. So if you can pre-tune them 
and you want them to be in tune and you can do so now, now would be the time to do it. You could use things like Melodyne. So if I jump in here and find Melodyne, if I just simply play a little bit, it transfers everything into Melodyne. And from there, I can jump around and start tuning things. Now, the interesting thing about this Melodyne, for example, the first two hits just are clearly not the same note, or at least it's not picking up the same note. And you can see these wobbles and cuts all around. That's because the source I've captured is quite harmonically rich. It's got a lot of overtones, a lot of details, probably some that are inharmonic in a way because of the way that it was ringing out and wobbling and affected with the water in there. Everything was just kind of like creating this very complex tone. Now the tones, I know the pitches because I tuned the pitch by ear, but they could do with maybe some slight tuning if I wanted to. So I could jump in here and tune them if I wanted. However, I'm kind of going for a more detuned kind of weird vibe. If you think of a carol on or you know church bells they might not all be perfectly tuned they might have that slight wonky type nature to them so i'm happy to you know have that kind of embraced a little bit in this library those imperfections so i'll actually just remove melodyne in this case however melodyne is a fantastic tool if you do want to tune anything because you can kind of drag everything back to the right place logic actually has flex time as well which is really useful it can tune pitch as well so that comes free in the door. All right, so we've gone through, we've removed the silence, we've added fades, we've possibly tuned, ready to export, right? Not quite. There is a final step that we need to do. And that, of course, is the all important naming conventions. Here's the thing, the sampler needs to know what group it should belong in, what note it actually is playing. All of those details are gonna be really important later on. Also for yourself, you don't wanna to have to play the note, play something on a piano to work out what that note is, and then go, oh, I can now put it into my sampler. You want your naming conventions to quickly tell you what note it is, what group it is, so you can do all of this without having to rely on your memory or your ear later on. So the naming convention that I usually like to do is I like to start my naming convention with the library name, in this case, Foalon, and then follow it with underscore the group it belongs in, so in this case, bells, then underscore the dynamic layer, so whether it's soft or loud or medium or whatever dynamic volume it is, and then underscore the note. So in this case, a little bit of a shortcut. All of these regions are going to require you to have foalon underscore bells. So why not do that all at once? So if I type in here, foalon underscore bells, you can even pop in an underscore at the end there because the next thing is going to be underscore soft or underscore loud. Once I've done, that's named that track. Now, if I select that track and make sure all the regions are selected and I hold down option shift N, it renames every region the same thing as the track name, which is really useful. Then what you can do is come in and rename each region. Now you can do that by just going Shift N on your keyboard. So I'm going to pop in, uh, in this case, it'd be soft with the dynamic layer, underscore, and then C2, because that's the note. Typical thing with naming convention, we always use sharps, never flats, because you can use the sharp symbol on your keyboard, and it helps keep it familiar that you're not working constantly between sharps or flats and having to work out which one's which. The other thing is that you need to decide what is going to be your middle C. Now contact middle C is C3. C3 is middle C. The lowest C on a keyboard that you can play, like a piano, would be C0. Now that may vary a little bit from music theory that you might be used to. The music theory in the US, for example, tells you that middle C is C4 and the first note that you can play, a first C that you can play on a piano is C1. That is technically true. However, we're dealing with computers. Computers count from zero. So the MIDI standard for Roland and for Yamaha, which Logic and Contact use, is that you start on C0 and count up from there. So C3 would be our middle C. It's very important you remember that because otherwise, if you assign something C4 when you meant it to be C3, Contact's going to have a bit of a hard time. All right, so you would go through there and you would relabel everything. And once you're ready, you would select them all, jump up to File, into export and export eight regions as audio files. It's gonna make each one of these regions a separate audio file, and that's exactly what we're after. So in here, for example, I could create a brand new folder, call it bells, and then down here, it's basically giving you a way of uh, building a naming convention, I suppose. As long as you've got region name in there, then it's gonna take whatever you'd labeled each region as the name for each file consecutively. So the first one there, soft C2, and the next one would be loud C2 and so on. In here, if you want to normalize, you can. It's important to touch on normalization. Some people recommend it, some people don't. It depends on the library, it really does. In this case, for example, I've captured both soft and loud. Now, when I build my sample instrument, later on I can use velocity to change the volume of all the samples. So I might wanna just 
normalize everything, which brings them all to a set you know, volume as loud as they can go, and then have Velocity take care of the, you know, the volume later on. Or I can keep everything consistent, and that means that the volume of the sample is the volume I recorded it at, which means if there's a volume change, it's because I physically hit that harder. I quite like that method for this one. I don't really want to normalize everything because I want to kind of preserve the performance aspect. But if you were going for something a little more precise or a little more predictable, which may be needed because you might want something to be consistent all the time and easily shaped later on, then you might choose normalize. So I would sit export and it would go through and export the whole thing. So after all that, then we have eight audio files. Now, if you watch my last video, you know I plan to have 14 files from these glasses. Didn't actually end up turning out that way because I couldn't find enough glasses or bowls that could be tuned down enough or ring high enough out. So I've had to adapt a little bit and that's okay. Instead of having seven different notes, I had four different notes and I'm gonna have to make do with that a little bit later on. That's some of the joy of sampling though. You don't really know until you get in there and start trying it out. So sometimes, you know, it's just the way it works. All right, so now we have some audio sources recorded and ready for our sampling. But we have some more samples to make from hardware synthesizers and pads. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at how to create textures on a hardware synthesizer and how to record those quickly with some MIDI options. So be sure to subscribe and join the channel and ding the bell so that you get notified for that next video. Until then, I will catch you in the next one.